uh, present and who are those who are trying to unmute your audio please keep your audio mute so uh, so good afternoon one and all uh, so today with us we have dr shorid watajariya as a social person uh, shorid the can you hear me am i audible yes i can i can tanu i can thank yeah. you so uh, i'll come to this online lecture series and on behalf of the department of english vindapur college I, i welcome you to this online lecture series I, and i welcome all the participants who have joined today's session so uh, uh, it's customary to introduce our uh, respected speaker to the audience so uh, that's why uh, dr shorid bhattacharya is a lecturer in post colonial studies at the university of glasgow uk please uh, so it's a request uh, uh, to all the participants to keep your audio mute please otherwise i will have no option to uh, remove you from this session so it's request uh, uh, to the, all the audience to uh, all the participants so uh, dr shorid bhattacharya is a lecturer in post colonial studies at the university of glasgow uk his research interest include post colonial literature eco criticism transcultural studies marxism and literary form his works in these areas are either published or forthcoming in such journal as adl textual practice intervention iris university review and in edited books such as cambridge critical concepts magic realism the aesthetics and politics of global hunger and others his first monograph titled post colonial modernity and the indian novel on catastrophic realism was published online last month so uh, dr uh, watacharya is a founding co editor of chongla journal of literary and cultural inquiry so once again i welcome you the uh, to this online lecture series uh, on behalf of the department of english mirzapur college so uh, 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 i request you to uh, begin your session so over to you thank you tanma thank you um can first of all um, i can't see my video here on on screen uh, so can you see me uh Okay, uh, now now you are uh, uh, visible. Is yeah, it okay now? Because, yeah, because on my screen what I see are uh, faces of people who yeah, have yeah, participated. Yeah. Now, so now it's uh, okay. It's okay. You can see me. That that's the thing. Yeah. Because yeah. in Zoom, um, I, I I didn't talk before on Google Meet, so I don't know how it works. So if there is a problem, to okay. let me know. Okay. Okay. As okay. long as I can see you, it's all right. <laughs> so thank you, Tanmay, uh, for. organizing this online lecture series and also um for your kind invite um i thank you and uh, midnapur college and the department of english for organizing these lectures um so what i am going to be doing today is giving you a talk about um post colonial ecology and um what i am going to be doing as i have done previously as well because these are talks mainly catering to undergraduate postgraduate students so what i will do is explain um the key terms of this of this presentation and then in the second part give a reading of two short stories uh, respectively by mahashweta devi and ken saro viva to talk about how some of the things that i speak i talk about in the first part relate to the second part in the way they are represented in in the stories and complicate the stories so let me start with um so with post colonial um ecologies let me start with some of these key terms so post colonial comes from colonial now what happens here is that if you think about i mean in certain cases things such as eco criticism post colonialism these things they get to some extent diluted or neutralized over the years for a particular um, sort of a crystallization or let's say um for naturalization of these terms but if we think about the root words we'd understand some of the key things these terms are related with so we would know that colonial 
uh, post-colonial, the root term is colonial and then colony. Now, what is the meaning of a colony? So it is, according to Oxford English Dictionary, a country or area under the control of another country and occupied by settlers from that country. And it comes from the Greek word apoikia, meaning settlement, which was there in something, settlement of people far from home. That is 8th century BCE meaning. And then from there, in the 5th century AD, the Romans have, uh, we see that the Romans have taken the term and they have given a new term called colonus, which means former tenant. So what did colonialism come with, like, goes far back? But while it meant mainly from people of a particular country going to, let's say the concept of country is very vague here, of a particular territory going to another territory in search of jobs, there was no uh, let's say the formal meaning of jobs, opportunity, survival, and settle there through farming, let's say, through through having an understanding of a land that could be tilled, cultivated, etc. So colonialism is actually settlement of a particular uh, group of people and which retain ties with the land, the original land they come from. How do they retain ties? By maybe like cooking the same thing, or giving a few names to a particular land which they remember, renaming. So this is the way that colonial, but what is key about modern forms of colonialism, the last uh, two or three centuries, the European forms of colonialism is that because of the rapid change in industrialization, technology and communication, what we see is that there is lesser settlement, more relation between metropole and colony, where the colony, it becomes, some sort of a, let's say, um, a zone of extraction. Some from somewhere, trades and resource materials could be obtained, could be sent back to the metropole. New things could be made out of them, and then probably sold to the colonial market. So more of a colony is more of a market, a free neoliberal market. That's that's the meaning that is coming from. Now. According to now, these are things that I'm taking from um, Robert Young's book. Uh, some of you may al already know Empire, Colony, and Post Colony. Now, there he talks about two kinds of colonies exploitation colonies, where the colony becomes a market, like a land to be cultivated, the resource and it, uh, to be extracted and exported, and settler colonies, where people go and settle, let's say Canada, let's say um, Australia. Uh, and in that sense, India or Nigeria or Kenya would be exploitation colonies where you know the crops uh, sort of uh, cash crops are produced be it cotton be it tea be it coffee and in the Latin American Southern American parts as well now why I say so to give you an understanding of ecology is that colonialism and ecological extraction or ecological damage so to say or ecological aspects are intimately tied if you settle somewhere you end up either owning the land, the concept of owning or possessing, or you are trying to survive by making something out of it. So this is precisely where I believe that colonialism, a study of colonialism or post-colonialism could hardly be ignored, could hardly be done without a study of the ecosystem, the ecology, or the resources, be it water, that the basic ones, land, water, food, later on, maybe oil, so this is the definition that Eleka Bummer in her book, Colonial and Postcolonial Literature gives about um, for colonialism. So what she says is colonialism is the settlement of territory, and I quote her, the settlement of territory, the exploitation or development of resources, and the attempt to govern the indigenous inhabitants of occupied lands, often by force, unquote. Now this appears in a book on page two. So this is the point that I wanted to make in the very beginning that colonialism cannot be uh, understood without an understanding of the ecosystem that it disturbs, disrupts or transforms. Now, to come from there uh, to the post-colonial. So you would also know, a lot of you would probably know about a famous definition that Bill Ashcroft, Gareth Griffith and Helen Tiffin uh, gave in their uh, uh, phenomenally world-known, sort of widely-known book, The Empire Rides Back, 
theory and practice in post-colonial studies. So what they write is that we use the term post-colonial to cover all the culture affected by the imperial process from the moment of colonization to the present day. This is because there is a continuity of preoccupations throughout the historical process initiated by European imperial aggression. So we also suggest it is most appropriate as the term for the new cross-cultural criticism, which has emerged in recent years and for the discourse through which this is constituted. In this sense, this book is concerned with the world as it exists during and after the period of European imperial domination and the effects of this on contemporary literatures. So this is the definition that comes to us through them about the continuity of colonial means of production, colonial means of, uh, let's say, controlling lives, the rule of law, education, all of these things that we have inherited from our colonial past might not be the same in the Mughal time or in the Gupta period. So the kind of life that we live is a direct continuity. I'm not saying uninterrupted, of course, an interrupted widely transformed continuity, but there is a continuity that we are following. This is precisely the conflict that we have in our everyday lives between modernity and tradition, and something that so many novelists in the 30s and 40s and 50s onward, especially based in the rural areas, have so well documented, the urban-rural divide. So the point being that the post-colonial continues with a disruption, uh, the modes of the colonial. Now, this is something that has been there. My point here, as I said to you, that it is impossible to talk about colonialism uh, without an understanding of ecosystem or ecology. It is impossible to talk about the post-colonial without an understanding of how some of our most useful resources on an everyday basis, water, land, food, is politicized, strategically produced, strategically deprived, how we are dispossessed on a on a daily basis some of the things that we see look at some of the problems that we have seen in the last two months the immense migrant crisis that we have seen the immense problem with being able to let's say being able to not only supply food but reach food to certain areas a lot of the people have commented that hunger and famine committing of suicide by agriculturalists in india is less a matter of not having enough food than a matter of politically produced problem, a matter of governance. There is enough food, but they're not reaching the area. So the point being that when we talk about post-colonialism, that means when you talk about our own lives, the way we live our life, the way our lives are structured, we may hardly ignore the question of how our lives are governed, how those governing of the life creates an ecosystem, an ecology, an interaction between man in a broad sense, humans and nature non-human beings. That is what is the meaning of ecology, ecology, that is the science of knowing it, the ecosystem, the system of knowing it. So to come back to the uh, question of post-colonial, uh, post-colonialism and ecology, if these two are so closely related, um, this is not my words. In the last 10, 15 years, these have been matters of critical scrutiny, objects of inquiry by leading post-colonial critics. I'd, I'd quote you a couple of them to establish the case and then move on to the uh, to the stories then. Now, what is happening? I mean, uh, some of you may have known a very uh, noted essay by Rob Nixon called Postcolonialism and Environmentalism. Rob Nixon has written an influential book called Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor. So this book uh, was in 2011 and this essay, Postcolonialism and Environmentalism, it was published in 2005 in a book, uh, in an anthology called Postcolonial Studies and Beyond. Uh, now, this is where Rob Nixon talks about how both of these fields, environmental studies and postcolonial studies are so close, and yet they have not been interacting with each other so well. So thanks to them, of course, some of the ideas that I am talking about today, go back to some of their studies, of course. And you could go back far back in Rachel Carson, even back, in Thoreau, you can go back and recover uh, authors, thinkers, even in the 15th and 16th century, who have shown tendencies 
or ideas in their writings. Think about, for instance, if you are Bengali, you know probably very well, Bibhuti Bhushan Bandhapadhyay, uh, the novel Arunnok. Now, this is something that I would like to say is that you in Bengal or in, in certain parts, let's say the post-colonial parts, our lives and nature are not very far away from each other. The way we grew up, the way we see, um, the way we interact with nature, think about from the very first day till the, till the end, think about the things that we do as part of rituals that have condensed as part of rituals of uh, you know, praying to the sun, or uh, you know, pray, or, or sort of making sure that do not touch the plant at night because plants seem to be um, sleeping as well. All these generational talks, oral talks that have come down to us, and as I said, they have made our lives a, a mode of contradiction between modernity, rationality, and between this sort of generational transmission of of oral thoughts, ideas, things that you would understand either way, otherwise as baseless. But but the way that life is, so this is the point that I want to make. Bibhuti Bhushan might not know of post-colonial eco-criticism. Of course, he might not, not even, the field was not even there. But Bibhuti Bhushan had already given you a framework to which to understand the relationship between life, humans and nature, humans and the non-humans. Now, the point is not whether an author, whether an author talks about it. The point is how they do it. Of course, in plenty of writings, you would find nature. Think about Mongol Kabbo in the Bengali traditions. Think about even far back. What do we, as a writer, what do we even, ex what are we even expected to represent in the world outside? The world outside would automatically come. So the point is not if a writer or an artist is representing a world outside. The point is how are they doing it? Are they doing it in the same way every time? Even if we think about Bibhuti Bhushan, is Vibhuti Bhushan doing the same thing in Chadir Pahar and Arunnok or Pothet Pachali? So these are the things we need to think about when we think about how an author represents the relationship between the humans and the non-humans. This is where, now that we have got a framework of post-colonial eco-criticism, I'll establish with a couple of quotes again, then we could take some of these ideas and think about how some of our own more local writers or even global writers represent the relationship between, let's say, humans and the non-humans, broader form of nature. So what is, so the particular framework that I do, I'll talk about it and um, I can explain it if later on we have time for Q&A, etc. So here is what, listen to uh, what, in this book, uh, Post-Colonial Eco-Criticism, Graham Hagen and Helen Tiffin, they define the term post-colonial eco-criticism and what should literature do at this point of time? What are we supposed to do? Is not taking care of nature a part of policy and science? Of course not. We are interacting on a daily basis. So how is it that literature then represents the way we interact with nature on a daily basis? What, what is the role of literature and art in all this? So this is what Graham Hagen and Helen Tiffin write in their book, in the introduction, this is on page six. Post-colonial studies, and I quote them, post-colonial studies has come to understand environmental issues, not only as central to the projects of European conquest and global domination, but also as inherent in the ideologies of imperialism and racism on which those projects historically and persistently depend. Not only were other people often regarded as part of nature and thus treated instrumentally as animals, but also they were forced or co-opted over time into Western views of the environment, thereby rendering cultural and environmental restitution difficult, if not impossible to achieve. Once invasion and settlement had been accomplished, or at least once administrative structures had been set up, the environmental impacts of Western attitudes to human being in the world were facilitated or reinforced by the deliberate or accidental transport of animals, plants, and peoples throughout the European empires, instigating widespread ecosystem change under conspicuously unequal power regimes. So this is the kind of relationship that I was talking about that 
colonialism was actually an instrument of extracting either resources or people, uprooting them from one place and restituting them at, into another, where the restitution itself is a very difficult thing because you are uprooting cultures and traditions there as you are uprooting bodies and resources. So this is something where colonialism, which has been more dominantly read in a more cultural framework, in a more textual framework, needs to be bring needs to be sort of compared, sort of brought into the fold of the environmental, the ecological, and the economic aspect of it. Colonialism was an economic a production related system, a system of you know, producing values and surplus. Uh, I would not go much into this. To come back to Graham Hagen and uh, Helen Tiffins, understanding what they add later, what is the role of post-colonial eco-criticism then? I quote them again. Post-colonial eco-criticism preserves the aesthetic function of the literary text while drawing attention to its social and political usefulness. Its capacity to set out symbolic guidelines for the material transformation of the world. To that extent, it can be seen as an interventionist or even activist enterprise. So this is something that I would like to think about, that doing post-colonial eco-criticism, trying to understand how exactly was nature controlled, devised, designed, uprooted, extracted, the process of it, and how that helps, how that builds a consciousness, a consciousness where some people could be understood as naturally inferior. You know, the dominant discourses of a particular time period where racism is not seen as racism, but natural. Where casteism is not seen as casteism, but natural. Now, these are the dominant discourses we are talking about. So doing post-colonial eco-criticism would be to find out how a consciousness coming out from these discourses, from these practices, is inherent in how somebody sees or perceives things. So if you read Shakespeare, The Tempest, then you can understand that the island troupe of domination and subordination is then forwarded, let's say, in Robinson Crusoe. And then let's say much later, even in White Sergeso C, or even much later, even today, who knows, in the Hungry Tide. So think about how islands and how particular perceptions have gone on to define how certain humans are and how certain humans are not about human values. So post-colonial eco-criticism would be to understand, to read through texts, their textual strategies, those values, the styles and formal stylistic aspects, which would allow you to give a framework to understand how certain values have shaped our life and how extracting trees, uprooting them for timber, for modernity, for our modern life has been a natural course of action, something that we never think about. Uh, of course, we need to buy a chair. Of course, we need to sort of, you know, wooden, um, buy more furniture, etc. Or maybe like more well-designed, let's say even sustainable um, sort of development might also display use of wood. And now why I say, so keep coming back to wood and trees is that deforestation is probably a more, a most iconic aspect of modernity and development as well as colonial forms of extraction. So this is also true for the story that I'm going to be reading today, uh, not just reading out, of course, uh, discussing today briefly, um, that is Shikar, Mahasheta Devi's Shikar or the hunt. Now, this is now the strategy that I'm talking about is something that um, another post-colonial critic, Upamunu Pablo Mukherjee, calls an eco-materialist study. This is something that he writes in his in his book called Postcolonial Environments. 
Nature, Culture and the Indian English Novel, published in 2010, he says that to understand the material, and I quote him, the material unevenness of the world and its aesthetic consequences, what is needed is an eco-materialist reading. Instead of attempting to locate aesthetic values in the exotic uniqueness of a cultural form, we can look for it in the stylistic and formal moves employed there as a result of the relationship with other cultural forms inhabiting similar environmental matrices. This is in page 77 to 80, roughly. So this is something that I would like to think about is how reading itself becomes, as Gramagan and Helen Tiffin calls, interventionist. Through reading, you unfold, you, let's say, deconstruct, you reveal, or in a very classic Marxist term, demystify certain conceptions, ideologies, perceptions that controlled human mind and human, that have controlled human mind and human uh, methods or practices of modernity. And that is the thing that reading allows you. So, so this is something I wanted to talk about and move on to these stories. Of course, I'd not have a lot of time to talk about these stories in, in um, details, but point being that if you have this framework, it would allow you to read much more from, from there and from your, from your own interests. That is the point that I would like to uh, make with this, with this introduction. About Mahashweta Devi, this is the second part of the talk and will be like shorter than the first one. About Mahashweta Devi's um, uh, story, Shikar or The Hunt, um, think, I mean, Mahashweta Devi and Kensaro Viva, both of them are noted activists and writers or writer activists, let's say. One is from India, another is from Nigeria. So Mahashweta Devi, uh, to a Bengali readership, is definitely very widely known. She has been translated by leading post-colonial uh, literary critic, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, called Imaginary Maps. And she has been translated widely into English by a number of, uh, uh, by a number of um, writers and critics. Uh, and academics published mostly by Siegel, and you can find out um, about Devi. Uh, so this particular short story, Shikar or The Hunt. Um, so I, I read Shikar in Bengali, of course, much before, and probably called Mahashita Devi Chotogal Pushankarun, um, sort of collection of stories selected by the author, handpicked, so to say. And then um, I, I, I saw it again, like it was translated in imaginary maps, so I read it again. Um, so point that I want to make is that if you know the story, this is a story about the Orao uh, tribe. So this is a story about Mary Orao. What happens here is that Mary is born as a bastard. Let's say um, this is a story that, that is set in um, uh, 1950s or 60s, let's say, uh, late 50s, because the story starts with this idea that the British have left, but there are timber plantations going on, and the Indian bourgeoisie or the Indian state have now that sort of seized it. And the same thing has continued, sort of uh, the trees being felled and um, widespread deforestation going on in the name of modernization and modernity, and the impact of it on, um, on the tribal community, on the peasants around that. And this is, maybe this is in, uh, this is Mahashweta never, so it's in Dalton Ganj, most, and the Kuruda, the Kuruda uh, village, the Tohori is, th these are some of the specific names that come out in the story to sort of set it geographically, but it would not be wrong to read it as any story in India, as any story of marginalization and deforestation in India. So there are three particular things going on here in this story, For in my reading, in a brief reading, in the way that I have framed it. One is definitely this timber plantation, kind of looting that is going on, and bonded labor. This is the first strategy that uh, I think Mohashita uses to give us an understanding about how colonial framework of using, extracting resources in the name of modernity have continued in the post-colonial state. Now, this is something we have to think about that we are all complicit in it. It's not that we have not thought about it, we, have, we are like, Virtue signaling, so to say, we are holier than thou. We have all we are implicated in it, as is Mohashweta. 
what she tries to do is to remind us that we are implicated in it. The guilt that it the guilt that could be also used as a productive force for change. So the way we, the mainstream that Mahasveta keeps telling us, the mainstream, and we are the mainstream, we know about what is happening in our country, and the margins, the margins that we don't know about, the margins that we don't talk about more often, be it tribals, the Adivasis, the Dalits, the Muslims, the margins and uh, the peripherals. I think what Mahashweta says in her, in her stories about Adivasis is more peripheral, much more peripheral than even certain more marginalized groups. People that we don't see, don't they are invisible, invisibilized by the state, or probably in some cases demonized, that they are the obstacles to modernization and progress. So what is happening is that this is the framework that she gives, that the same framework that once told us that we Indians are barbaric or we Indians are against progress, the same thing that now that certain Indians are for progress, certain Indians are against progress. So this is the same topic, the same logic of progress and development that we are following. And that is a reminder that Mahashavita gives us that we have just continued in the way. There are ruptures, but we have continued. The other thing that she shows in the story is a notion of a communitarian life. What I mean by communitarian life is that Mahashweta does talk about in a number of her um, sort of prefaces or essays, and of course in plenty of her short stories, uh, that tribal life is socialized, social. It is very ethos. It is not property oriented or capitalistic. It is dependent on more of a communal gang, uh, bonding and gathering. And throughout this story, we see that um, that the honor of women, and it is a story of Mary Orau, gender and, and let's say, uh, communitarian life, they are not at, at a sort of a clash with each other. They enable each other. There are particular roles for, for gender, of course, but these roles are not at the cost of another role, at the cost of others. So this is where we see that there, are, there, there is a festival uh, it's called the annual hunting festival, where uh, the tri every annually the tribals, the male tribals, would hunt and they would all sit and sort of um, let's say, sort of a festival of eating, drinking, singing together. And every twelve years, this festival, uh, the woman is gives this is the festival takes a gender turn, of course, and it's of course gendered because every twelve years the woman is given a turn, but the woman is still given a turn to hunt. It's not entirely a male affair. And this is the day when uh, the, the story is about this particular day. Uh, later when it comes to this day, of course, um, that when Mary is also taking part in the in the hunt. But what happens in between is that she, she was working in, uh, um, in a, um, let's say, a bungalow, uh, which was a colonial bungalow now taken over by the, by the Prasads from Branchi. And there she was working. As I said, she was an illegitimate child. So this person, um, so this British uh, who was owning the colonial British, he came back uh, to sort of, I think his son comes back to sell the property, etc. This is also when the caretaker, the domestic help, who was um, there for a long time in, 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 in this colonial bungalow. Um, so this British um, uh, colonial or the, the post-colonial, um, so he, he then um, has sexual relationship with um, this woman, uh, the caretaker, and then Mary is born. By the time he leaves uh, this colonial British, he has left for Australia. So Mary is born slightly uh, more let's say, um, the, the, the description that comes from Mahashvita is copperish, but glowy. So this is not exactly uh, the color of uh, the Oraos. That's precisely where he, she is an outsider. She's not entirely into the fold. They don't trust her. But at the same time, they also uh, think that she's, she's brilliant. And she is. She's very hardworking. She's fierce. She's strong. And she wants to flee uh, this sort of, she wants to get away with this job of taking care of the Prasad's house, marry um, this Muslim, Zalim, and leave as long as she has, the moment she has like 100 rupees. Both of them are like earning for that. Now, what happens in the end of the story is that this timber plantation is then, um, as then there are like a couple of people, they arrived uh, who are uh, sort of, they're going to be felling trees and um, 
first one of them is called Tashilda Singh and he fancies Mary and then he harasses her and then later on he sort of makes sure that uh, you know if there is a, if Mary and, and Mary and him could sort of meet somewhere etc uh, and Mary gets to know that he's married he has children etc um, in, in, in a town and it reminds her of the life that her mother had and um, she's actually throughout it's very I mean it's not um, I don't have to sort of point out that she's independent and strong strong willed and what happens in the end is that uh, during this hunting uh, to come back to the end of the story during this hunting Mary comes Mary sort of goes away from the team and then goes and meets Tashilda Singh and, and sort of kills him uh, there um, sort of uh, with, um, with with a, with a with a local instrument with so the point being that the novel, the, the short story ends with uh, with sort of resistance to violence. This is the third point that I wanted to make here, that violence is key to, to this story, sort of returning with violence. So this is something that I wanted to um, remind you that, that this is something that is happening in, in many of Mahashvita's stories. Some of you may know about Dobdi Draupadi or Dobdi Mejin um, or even Boshai Duru that there is a return, there is a resistance, because if lives and cultures and resources have been systematically dispossessed, deprived, and of uh, people who do not come into the framework of, let's say, the bourgeois understanding of law, or even a human, if they're outside of the frame, they're never taken care of, they do not necessarily have to go with the framework that we operate in. Most of these violent acts that we consider violence would rather come from the margins, be it the Santal Revolution or the movement, however you call it, be it the, the Birsa Munda, the Munda one, be it later on, even much of the 1857 rebellion was enabled by events leading to it from the 1830s onward, especially mostly from the, from the tribal world, so to say. So the point being that Mahashweta was later on asked that she glorifies violence. And this is what she talks about in, in an interview with uh, Gaitri Spiva that was also published in uh, Imaginary Maps. And I'll read out a little section there to give you an understanding about Mahashweta's uh, sort of why she sort of wrote about, just sort of ended the story in this way. So, right. So this is um, what she says, the tribals, and I quote her, the tribals and the mainstream have always been parallel. There has never been a meeting point. The mainstream simply does not understand the parallel. As long as the forests were there, the hunting tribes did not suffer so much because the forests used to provide them with food, shelter, timber, hunting. But now that the forests are gone, the tribals are in dire stress. Unquote. Now, I, this is coming from somebody who has, who has lived with tribals in different parts of India, with tribals and the forest people, so to say, for years, for decades. So some of these insights are coming from, from let's say, her, her ethnographic life or her literary activist life from the periphery. Now, this is also something that, um, yes, that she says. Um, th uh, consider this particular framework where uh, she puts notion of violence right so this is the consideration of the of the animal hunting so i quote march with again the tribals have this animal hunting festival in bihar it used to be the festival of justice after the hunt the elders would bring offenders to justice they would not go to the police in santali language it was the law beer law is the law and beer is forest and every 12th year, it is Jani Parab, the women's hunting festival in Bihar. Every event narrated within the story is true. What Mary did that day has been done in that area again and again. Among the tribals, insulting or raping a woman is the greatest crime. Rape is unknown to them. Women have a place of honor in tribal society. When I went to Lapra, I would see this light-skinned girl in a yellow sari worn in a village way. On the back of the big old buffalo, sitting in the most relaxed manner, chewing sugarcane, maybe chewing popcorn. I see her in Tohori market, 
bargaining for fruit and other produce, chewing pan, etc., etc. I learned this. So I learned, uh, sorry, um, quote again, every event that the tribals come to know, they transfer to song. They do not write. They have retained the memories of their fights of natural calamities in this way. Some collections are being made sitting around the fire on a winter night under the open sky. I came to know her story. And that man was just like a lakra, a wolf that had been killed. The real point is, Gayatri, that it is Jani Parab, the women's hunting festival day. She resurrected the real meaning of the annual hunting festival day by dealing out justice for a crime committed against the entire tribal society. One of the great causes, one of the causes of the great Santa revolt of 1855-56 was the raping of tribal women. People say that in the story I have gone too much for bloodshed, but I think as far as the tribals or the oppressed are concerned, violence is justified. When the system fails in justice, violence is justified. The system resorts to violence when people rise to redress some grievance to protest. India is supposed to be a non-violent country, but in this non-violent country, how many firings, how many killings by bigots take place every year? When the system fails an individual, an individual has a right to take to violence or any other means to get justice. So this is what she goes on, and I'm not going to be reading out uh, again for time. Point being that this is something, if you remember, this is something that she's doing in 1995, that about how far is a certain form of violence ordained by the state is justified and certain other forms of violence, not within the same framework, not justified. So in a sense, this is something that comes to, uh, to us through, through Fanon as well. If you read The Wretched of the Earth, there is a chapter called Concerning Violence. And this is where, and this is what Fanon says, in short, the violence, and I quote Fanon, the violence which has ruled over the ordering of the colonial world, which has ceaselessly drummed the rhythm for the destruction of native social forms and broken up without reserve the systems of reference of the economy, the customs of dress and external life, that same violence will be claimed and taken over by the native at the moment when deciding to embody history in his own person, he surges into the forbidden quarters, unquote. Uh, and this tiny um, ad, ad here, it is not enough for this settler to delimit physically, that is to say, with the help of the army and the army and the police force, the place of the native, as if to show the totalitarian character of colonial exploitation, the settler paints the native as a sort of quintessence of evil. Native society is not simply described as a society lacking in values. It is not enough for the colonists to affirm that those values have disappeared from or still better, never existed in the colonial world. The native is declared insensible to ethics. He represents not only the absence of values, but also the negation of values. He is, let us dare to admit, the enemy of values. And in this sense, he is the absolute evil. This is Richard of the Earth, page 41. So this is something that I wanted to tell you, um, remind you of, of the use of violence in some of Nahashweta's stories and how far is, and this is something that I want to keep it open to discuss and how far would such a, would, would an act of violence against somebody um, also a symbolized format of taking, of sort of doing justice for the violence that is done on the entire tribe or entire gendered body. So very briefly now, I move on to um, I move on to now um, the other story. Africa kills a son. I'll be very brief here. Um, this is a story by Ken Saroviva. He is a Nigerian writer uh, and more, mostly known as a Nigerian um, activist. Ken Saroviva um, was from the uh, he he was an Ogoni or from the Ogoni people in the River State, Nigeria, um, and Nigeria is. Like later part, like from the 60s and 70s, Nigeria, when the oil was discovered, uh, the sort of petroleum and oil was, was discovered in Nigeria, then what happened is suddenly the whole focus shifted uh, from this from the civil war to a modernizing Nigeria with the oil boom. And oil was found as it is in the peripheries, in the most deprived areas, poor areas. And the violence that oil always associates with in terms of its extraction the violence on 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 on, on the resources on soil um, and also the atmosphere the pollution that it creates so this leads to 
a long term sort of conflict between the Ogoni people and the Nigerian state that uh, Kensa Roviva later on lead, uh, led and represented something called Mosop, movement of the Ogoni, movement of the survival of the Ogoni people uh, that he that he built, that he organized and then led. And this also then led fi finally this sort of his nonviolent modes of protest and his exposure in expo uh, of, of people from within the Ogoni um, sects or from within some of these um, deprived areas complicit in the work of the state. Uh, this leads to hanging of a trial and a very uh, summary trial and hanging of um, Saroviva. So Saroviva is of course widely known as an environmental activist and he also know, uh, is known for a novel he wrote, Souza Boy, and television work that he has produced and worked in, uh, and a book of essays or a sort of, let's say, um, reflections called Genocide in Nigeria. And um, these are things that, that are very that are really widely uh, in nowadays, uh, at least discussed in post-colonial studies. Um, but this is a story, this is not related with um, about the Ogoni people and the, and the environmental campaign. Uh, a story of that particular framework would have definitely been key to our discussions today, but I chose it precisely because this gives a different understanding of both of violence at the same time about dissolution. So, so briefly again, what happens in this story written in 1989, when uh, Saroviva was not entirely like actively engaged with environmental politics and campaign, now this story um, is about this. So this is a story about a man, uh, Bana. He is writing a letter to his girlfriend Soul um, from a jail, from from the from the prison cell, and along with two of his friends, Zimba and Sazan. Now he, this is the final this is the final night before uh, his trial, before his uh, killing. Is it uh, the next day? And he tells her that. You know, he has been, um, all three of them, they've been wrongly implicated and charged, but they are not unhappy with it. In fact, they pleaded guilty because they, they felt that, so they were part of an armed robbery um, of um, of government property that would then, the point was for them that they were so tired of uh, the bureaucratic corruption and looting of the government by, so let's say, fair means that they wanted to sort of, um, seize things from the government and then distribute it to the public. Um, but this was all done with uh, senior police officers being involved in it. So this was all this was all going through all right. But one day there was some miscommunication, etc. So they were caught and they decided to plead guilty in order to save the others. That is the that is what he says in this letter to his girlfriend, school time, one long back girlfriend, um, about how uh, um, about so the, so the entire story is in an epistolary format, later written uh, to somebody else. And what happens in this story is that he he reminds us about how society, a post-colonial Nigeria, where it has gone to, uh, corruption that is endemic to a post-colonial state, and then the kind of values that is that it produces. So I'll just quickly read out a couple of sections and then conclude my talk. So this is what uh, about the trial about uh, society, a middle-class society that uh, he writes about. You must have seen in uh, that in the papers too, and I quote uh, from the story. We saw it thanks to a bribe-taking friend, the prison guard, who sent us a copy of the newspaper in which it was reported. Were it not in, the, in an unfeeling nation among a people inured to evil and taking sadistic pleasure in the loss of life, some questions might have been asked. No doubt, many will ask the questions, but they will do it in the safety and comfort of their homes, over the interminable bottles of beer, uncomprehendingly watching their bone cheap television programs, the rejects of Europe and America, imported to fail their vacuity. They will salve their conscience with more bottles of beer, wash the answers down their gullets, and pass question, conscience, answer out as vest into their open sewers, choking with contracted filth and murk, and they will forget. So this is the kind of this is the kind of anger that that he 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 has. If uh, anger would be a would be probably a, an understatement or maybe like an inadequate word. Throughout the letter, he is enjoying writing it, but these are these are moments where 
you know the the sort of the rage comes out this uh, about about um, a corrupt post colonial state again i it was there i quote again from the book it was there the short story i mean i came face to face with the open looting of the national treasury the manner of which i cannot describe without arousing in myself the deepest barest emotions everyone was busy at it and there was no one to complain to everyone to whom i complained said to me if you can't beat them join them i was not about to join anyone i wanted to beat them and took it upon myself to wage a war against them in no time they had gotten rid of me dismissed me i had no option but to join them then i had to make a choice i became an armed robber a bandit it was my choice my answer and i don't regret it so you you see the where where the tension lies where the where the problem the source of the problem that you didn't want to be part of it and think about how many stories and novels and films you have seen from the 50s and 60s across in post colonial regions that talked about the dissolutionment of um of the post colonial life about about of the independent life the things have continued to be the same it's just that symbolically of got like more uh, rights and more visibility than before but probably the same thing has gone even things have become more corrupt um, um with with the uh, with the with the post colonial with the independent state and this is something that i would like to end uh, with is that um i mean throughout the story you will see that how every part of the repressive or the ideological state machinery be it the police be it the uh, policy makers be it the academics are all involved in producing think about what mahashweta also wrote that the mainstream went in parallel with what whatever sort of dissented or you know was peripheral to it so they never matched together they never they never uh, uh, sort of interacted with each other so they never they were never been able to sort of represent each other adequately um so this is the final bit of it the, uh, the, the of course the story ends with uh, that they're happy and reminding some of the some of the nicer times and at the same time telling uh, zol that Uh, you know what has gone on ecologically economically and politically in this particular and how disillusioning it is and how even our death been telecasted and how it has become a spectacle of death something that akil bembe uh, calls mutual zombification in the book uh, on the post colony so the 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 story ends with this particular interesting sort of this end um where he defines where he tries to find out that now that i'm going to be dead tomorrow Uh, let's find out an epitaph what would be the best epitaph for me and this is what he writes uh, in the penultimate paragraph uh, and i quote him i recall many years ago as a young child reading in a newspaper of an african leader who stood on the grave of a dead lieutenant and through his tears said god africa kills her sons and god I don't know what he meant by that and though I have thought about it long enough I have not been able to unravel the full mystery of those words now today this moment they come flooding back to me and I want to borrow from him I would like you to put this on my gravestone as my epitaph god africa kills her son and god a good epitaph eh? cryptic definite a stroke of genius i should say i'm sure you will agree with me africa kills her son that's why she's been described as the dark continent yes so uh, i'm quote and i um, go to the concluding remarks is that you understand how you know africa kills her sons to africa kill a son becomes like a transition almost um a euphemistic transition uh, where a state is complicit in killing its own subjects uh, a state that claims to stand for protect its own subjects its own citizens and the irony the mockery the mockery uh, the mocking tone in which uh, bana writes about that that sons to the sun is about how by killing our own 
we transition from a world of light and justice to a world of darkness. So is the dark continent given to us by the colonialists or is it something that we are continuously sort of forwarding by the act that we have inherited from the colonists? Mm -hmm. So this is something that I wanted to talk about. And I would, I would stop here um, with, with this idea that a reading, a materialist reading, could be able to give us an understanding, a framework through which to read this disparate, differently located writings and to compare them, to find out through them what went through, how, how ideas and perceptions were controlled and designed and practiced, and how we can see through their age old or their temporal and spatialized discourses through such through such let's say action through such activity of doing postcolonial eco criticism so this is where i would conclude and stop thank you so much for listening uh, thank you sir. Uh, so really it was an uh, enumerative wonderful adjustive session and i truly really believe that our audience is taking away much more from this lecture from this talk so uh, it was very informative uh, session it was really so now it's time for questioning uh, so from the audience if they do have any question so they can ask you directly so i now invite questions from the participants Thank hello you. sir am i audible uh, yeah. yes I'm Nikisha Devuri from Mednapur College Autonomous. So my question is that, uh, being, uh, being the part of nature, uh, we see in this post-colonial uh, literature, um, mm -hmm. in the, from the perspective of uh, ecology, we see that uh, being the part of nature, uh, uh, we are fighting against nature. And uh, are you audible, sir? Yeah, this is because your voice is getting disconnected sometimes. Uh, it's a bit broken. Okay, so uh, we see yeah. that being the part of nature, we are, uh, we are fighting against nature, and uh, we see a lot of you know corruption, violence, and all that. But uh, do they, this uh, post colonial literature somehow lead us uh, back to nature or show us some way back to nature, or just uh, expect us to feel guilty and uh, uh, somehow uh, way back to nature? Of course, yes. Um... Thank you for the question, Rina. And um, so I'll just answer whatever questions come in um, individually. So this is, um, so my point, my, my feeling is that post-colonial literatures would not take us back to feel guilty and stay home. I think an understanding of nature has been there in literature from the very day literature itself was born. Literature can't be done without an understanding of the non-literary, or rather the world outside, as I said in the lecture. What post-colonial literature does is, is to remind us that, that literature itself has become refined. Literature itself has become abstract. Literature was born, painting was born, to give us an understanding of how the world operates outside. Now, if our literatures have been refined by different kinds of aesthetic frameworks, which have allowed, which have given nature less and less space, space and time, then some of the post-colonial literatures will remind us that some of the oldest conflicts are still about land, are still about water, are still about relationships, especially if you're seeing it from the peripheral rural world, not from the urban world that is a concentration of wealth, is a concentration of population. In India, for instance, 72%, I think, the last census, 72% of the population, that's 800 million, more than 80 crores and 90 crores live in villages. And our literatures have continued to become, our cultures have continued to become urban, urbanized. So does it reflect India's identity much more sincerely? The question is not authentic. The question is, what is the identity that we are proposing through literature? I think post, post-colonial literature, if it is a literature coming out from the rural and the agricultural parts, which could still continue with the system of colonialism and with the system of subordination and domination much more prominently, then the literature will have to show to sort of return our gaze to some of the things the literature started with in a more pre-colonial, if there is a term called pre-colonial set, set up, or even like how 
we interact with nature from the peripheral world. This is precisely what, to my meaning, literature does in these in these uh, texts. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm saying these questions, and it's a really awesome uh, lecture. I have heard you uh, earlier in school calls. Uh, I'm going to ask you the questions. So, we are. So, uh, your voice is coming properly to me. Uh, Koshi, can you hear me? Kosik, uh, your voice is not coming clearly. Okay, sir. Okay, I'm trying. Can now you it's audible? Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm referring to a quote. A quote from us written with the. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't hear you. Kosik, yeah. Kosik, it's actually. Uh, you type your question. Uh, quickly time your voice is your... not clear so uh, you can uh, you can do one thing just message that in the chat box your question okay okay that will be thank better. you thank you yes hello is yes, sir. The... yes. Uh, am i audible sir yes yes uh, yes uh, first of all i would like to thank you for this wonderful session and secondly uh, i would like to apologize because my observation come question is going to be a little bit digressive from the actual topic but i'm going to mm. quote some uh, lines from the very book that you have also used for your quotations uh, the book uh, post colonial eco criticism right so right. what i would be asking you about is the ideas of hegemonic centrism and the speciesism where there is a quotation by derrida that the humanist concept of subjectivity is inseparable from the discourse and inst institution of a speciesism which relies on the tacit acceptance that the full transcendence to the human records a sacrifice of the animal and the animalistic so i would right. like to know your comment on that that whether the post colonial literature and all these things are doing enough to uh, take over in this thing called that uh, post anthropocene or something or uh, do you feel that or uh, even uh, even the stories that you talked about that what i felt is to a certain extent this hunting idea i'm not going to say that it is valorized but still Right. That there is a certain sense of negation of the non-human or the animalistic. Right. So I would like to know your ideas on that. Right. Thank you, Shobhat. Shobhat, is it? Yes. Right. Right. Because I can't see most of the faces. I'm just seeing the names. So uh, forgive me for that. Um, so my um, my take would be uh, from here, Shobhat, is that what we need as Anthropocene is actually our reading. If we tend to read the non-anthropocene in it, that will be equally effective. So if in, a, so for instance, remember Toru that's our casualty in a tree. Yes. Or even Bibhuti Bhushan's Arunnok. Now, if you have read either of them or both of them, you know that the consciousness of human relationship with non-human aspects is coming through a human being finally, of course. But this consciousness can be deconstructed. This consciousness can be disrupted by the way somebody represents. So if Mahashwita, for instance, represents Mary Ora to, uh, or talks about um, the hunting, the hunter-gatherers, how hunting has itself become meaningless in this particular world. And I, sorry, I, I could not read out this quote, which probably would have situated Mahashweta's point much better. So in, in the in the story, and I, I just like translated it into English because I couldn't get the imaginary maps um, uh, right now with me. So this this is the quote that I wanted to read out, but didn't have time enough. So this is at one point Mahashweta's narrator says, "Why the hunt? They don't know. The male know. They have been hunting for hundreds of hundred, hundreds and thousands of moons. There were wild animals in the forests." Life was uh, wild once. The hunting, their hunting, had a meaning. Now the forests are empty. Life is dissipated and exhausted. Hunting is meaningless. Just a matter of a day's joy. That's that's the quote, how the quote ends. Of course, you could always read through 
the word joy, anundo, um, it would also be like a festival, like a ritual, the humanistic part of it, the human-centered part of it, that killing animals is a joy. I could also read in this particular quote how certain groups, certain communities have been living with and in, let's say, forests or jungles without broadly or widely damaging the prospects for the jungle or for the prospects for the forest. Some it, something that Ken Viva also writes in some of his works, some sort of an animism that he talks about. Now, my point here is that if we analyze and evaluate the amount of damage that colonialism has done to forests and, and then post-colonialism has inherited, the post-colonial world has inherited, the concept of modernity that comes from enlightenment in a more blunt sense has done more damage than these tribal people, indigenous people living in forests and especially living on hunting gathering. And hunting itself is a something that is uneven with the kind of world that we live in, where jobs, business, etc. cetera, the, the world doesn't operate through hunting. So my point is Mahashwita is bringing together two or three different kinds of worlds, different kinds of production to show that how uneven our society is and how, how uneven it would be to, to evaluate, to juxtapose or to impose ideas on a particular frame of practice or a particular form of practice. So I would rather say that it could be possible to do a deconstructive, a post-humanist or a, as you say, a de-anthropomorphizing study of Mahashweta's text uh, in this context. This is my, my short answer. But of course, I take your point. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. No problem. Uh, uh, Surida, so? in the comment box, uh, uh, right. Kosi Banerjee has written the question. Uh, who was fine uh, to okay. ask you directly. Okay, can so, you read uh, some of the, yeah. I, I can't, see, yeah. Yes, am I audible, sir, now? Yes, you um, are audible. Yeah, yes, sir. My question is that your lecture was really fantastic. I'm, I I have also heard you earlier in a review. Yeah. So my question right. is, we are tired of trees. Right. Hughes and Guterres says in, in a book, A Thousand Platers, that we right. should stop believing in trees roots right. and radicals for they have made us suffer too much you know so is deforestation is the outcome of this ab aboreal politics it's, it's a accepted aboreal politics even trump is coming outside of green revolutions even quite dissociate himself from that paris agreement for the development of ecology even mm. putin is taunting greta thunberg is, is, mm. is it a clear view that they are going towards ecological materialism? Is it a quite view? Means it's, it's giving us that view. Even, you know, that Draupadi in the Imashad Devi Draupadi, when Senanaka is, means uh, they are uprooted, the local peoples are uprooted. It, it is a mm. kind of rape of the people. Rape of the Draupadi is, is uh, yes, there is, but it is rip up the people so what is your take on it is it deforestations ecological materialism is they are not thinking about ecology so what is your take on this what do you tell in post-colonial perspective what your take please sir yes um thank you koshik um i have whatever i have uh, gathered from so whatever i could i could understand is that that um from from your question if i'm if i'm wrong um, yeah, just like um, correct me that uh, deforestation and um, ecological materialism. Now, ecological materialism is something that I read differently. So I would like you um, to sort of explain the term a little bit, if, you, if, if it's possible. So are you saying, if I'm reading you correctly, because answering you would be wrong, would be incorrect if I understand you correctly. So are you saying that um, deforestation has been the mode through which colonial and post-colonial uh, governments have worked, be it in India or be it your know, neoliberal governments such as the USA or maybe like somebody else in, in elsewhere. 
Is it the yes. thing that you? Yes, okay. they. Yes, yes, they are heading towards that ecological materialism, right. even not caring. Even the main motto is ecological discussion, but they have in mind their ecological materialism and they are discussing ecology. So they are dissociating right. themselves later, even signing up for that. Okay. Right, right. That's great. Thank you, Kushi. So the, my point here is that I think in the last, I mean, this idea of um, climate emergency, climate crisis, um, this is not, again, a European invention. Right. I mean, what is Greta uh, Thunberg is doing is absolutely commendable. But at the same time, we would know that plenty of um, what is known as the fourth world nations, indigenous people and uh, forest people have been protesting in different parts of the world. Not, uh, you know, not widely known precisely because uh, they are not to be represented. These are, these are not people. These are not voices. These are not claims that the state can represent because that would be against some of the ethics and the values that we as state subjects uh, subjects within the framework of the state of course other people are peripheral people are as well but we have more values we are more human so to say than some others we are our debts are more grievable than some others debts so this is something uh, that has 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 come into the framework of our life through an inculcation of values that goes back to colonialism so point being that the colonial world has ended, but a lot of the people, especially from the Marxist framework, would continue to say that it's not about only colonialism. It's the capitalist colonialism that is holding our that is holding our conception, that is holding our perception and values. As long as capitalism will continue, deforestation and modernity will be the modes. Uh, now, point is not whether capitalism is sustainable or capitalism um, will be replaced by socialism and socialism is more viable and sustainable. These are things that more discussions and more uh, thoughts need to be need to be put through. But the point being that deforestation, if it had, it had been, I think it had been the framework of doing colonialism and modernization and urbanization and modernity, then post-colonial states and neoliberal states will continue to do so. The response that post-colonial literature gives to it is a response where we understand that we they are reminding us that land is something that has been systematically stolen from them. So there is an essay by, uh, yes, this is an essay called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor by Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Young. It was published in 2012 about indigenous land rights activities and how uh, the whole point was that any movement of decolonization must start with returning land to the indigenous communities. Otherwise, it is all a symbolic, metaphorical decolonization. So what post-colonial studies and literature does, and this is precisely where I think Karam Hagan and Tiffin talks about, talk about this interventionist or activist, is to remind us that what we are doing is, in the form of art, literature, aesthetics, criticism, is an understanding of it, how ideologies are structured. Until and unless this kind of uh, giving back land to one, like we got back land from, let's say, uh, Britain uh, in 1947, some other people need to get back their lands from some of us, maybe. So until and unless that happens, a proper decolonization could never start. And all literature could do is to remind us that it needs to start. So this is what I think post-colonial literature and criticism does in, in short. Uh, now, anyone from the participants? Hello. Yeah. Hello, Shorida. Yes. Uh, hello, hello Shorida, this is Tariq. Yes, Tariq, please go on. Yes. Shorida, uh, uh, Glot Felty's book, The Eco Criticism Reader. Right. Which is considered as the fundamental guide uh, to the study of nature in literature. Right. Has room for only two non American essays. I mean, it is uh, mostly an all American cast. Right. Again, uh, the the essay, The Greening of the Humanities by Joy Jay Perini. Right. Uh, here, the author mentions 25 writers and critics uh, mm -hmm. whose work he thinks central to the global green studies globe. Right. But interestingly, all 25 writers and critics mentioned by Perini were all American. Now, right. why is this? My question is, why is this? Why is this American monopoly over literary environmentalism? And why is this uh, parochialism? Right. What do you think? Right. 
thank you thank you tari it's an excellent question as well uh, thank so, you shweta so what is so my uh, take again these are all my personal opinions is that environmentalism as a field of study began in the 50s and 60s in the us especially yeah. mostly widely with rachel carson's silent spring being read about yeah. talked about and the amount of uh, debates and discussions it provoked now um, in the 70s and 80s onward especially in the 70s with the, with the chipko movement and then guha and martin alvarez writing the book uh, the unquiet votes i think so this is i mean from the 80s and 90s madhava gadgil and then later on number of uh, critics publishing their work in the 80s and i'm not think, talking about whether they're thinking about the publishing their work making their works known to the world from the 90s onward it becomes more visible even uh, rob nixon's use of the term environmentalism of the poor comes from the so my point is from this is also if you remember in the 80s late 80s and 90s mostly early 90s late 90s is when post colonialism as a field as a discipline is more widely visible in the anglophone academy be it in the us or in the uk and then also later on in india so because post colonialism has and through subaltern studies collective etc south asian post colonial uh, concerns latin american concerns have been brought to the fold because it has happened in a slow manner i think it took some time for post colonial studies itself to bring back the environmental aspect because initially post colonial studies was more to do with in the earlier phase of it more to do with how knowledge is constructed how orientalism is constructed whether the subaltern can be represented more textual colonial discourse analysis that is happening in post colonial studies later on is when aspects social aspects ecological aspects are being brought to the fold more so because now more nuanced work is happening so from the if 19 from 2005 onward 2010 you can still say that plenty of uh, recent work that has done in that has been done in post colonial studies from um, elizabeth uh, delafry from sherry decart from pablo mukaji um a number of uh, mike niblet and others so this is the kind of work that has been done in the last 10 years or so they have explicitly dealt with or talked about post colonial eco criticism and i think the kind of work that we did slowly the field is getting more diversified more names of different as i said to you uh, about the young and dark essay so more things are coming out from let's say ex colonized countries this, this field is becoming more diverse so i think it will take a little more time for the field to take up this particular uh, particular framework and more people from within uh, ex colonized societies to talk about some of these concerns and this is precisely why i can talk about mary orao in this particular um, or, or or this uh, a few days back we would talk about novarum patricharya precisely because people like you and i when we start talking about the aspects i think we can get into far more details and far more nuances being based within these societies and then then represent it to the world this is precisely what mohashweta and ken saroviva did in their own um, in their own capacities okay thank you shurida i have uh, many more questions but i will later discuss with you okay <laughs> thank you yes hello sir if you kindly suggest some books uh, for the students uh, to begin with right. this subject this area right so um for for um beginners i think i mean if it is undergraduate and postgraduate students um probably a very good companion would be uh, some of the critical uh, theory series that orient uh, black swan um, publishes these these are not very uh, expensive as well and um, one of them is called eco criticism um, this is um, this is this gives you an understanding of how things have come out how this, sort of the movements theory the the implementation of theory in literature and then some of the discourses and this is published this is written by uh, an academic from iit madras if i'm not wrong and then um, Uh, published in in a uh, relatively uh, sort of um, affordable price so what happens is uh, this will give you a good understanding like especially with undergraduates uh, and early postgraduates and for people interested in 
slightly higher and advanced. Uh, and then there is a book by, of course, there is a book called Eco Criticism itself um, by Greg Carrot. And there is a, there are plenty of books in this, as as Tariq mentioned, Claude Felty. Um, Claude Felty, Cheryl Claude Felty came out with a book called post uh, Eco Criticism Reader. Uh, now, now these are in Eco Criticism. Um, Claude Felty's book and then Carrot's book as well, Greg Carrot or Greg Gerald, however you, um, and then you have more uh, alignment towards post-colonialism and ecology in eco-criticism. That is what I refer to in Graham Hagan and Helen Tiffin's book. It is called post-colonial eco-criticism. Then Rob Nixon's book called Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor came out in 2011. Uh, then pa Pablo Mukherjee's book, called Post-Colonial Environments, Nature, Culture, and the Indian English Novel. Now, these are, there are plenty of books after 2010 that have come out, but I think the book that I referred to in the beginning uh, from the critical theory, eco-criticism, that will give you an understanding about how, uh, what is the strand that post-colonial eco-criticism does, especially for undergraduates and postgraduates. And then somebody, if they're interested in research, these are some of the books that they can start with. Thank you. So uh, uh, now we can uh, uh, wrap up this session. Uh, sorry, the uh, uh, formal word of thanks, and that will be uh, delivered by our student of our PG course semester. Sundika? Uh, yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, a very uh, good afternoon, sir, and uh, all the participants here. Uh, I. Jonjika, on the behalf of the Department of English, Midnapur College Autonomous, would like to thank Dr. Shorit Bhattacharya, lecturer in post-colonial studies, University of Glasgow, and a noted academician, for enlightening us with such a wonderful and informative presentation. It was a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would like to thank our respective principal, sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Bera, and our head of the department, Tonmai Kundu, sir, for arranging this online lecture series during lockdown hours. And last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants across in India, yes, across India, for their participation and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, uh, good evening. Uh, can you take the last question of mine? Uh, I have my mic is disturbing, and so can I ask you? Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, Hello, I sir? think it's up to the organizers. Yeah. I have another five minutes, so I could be quick. Okay. Or you could just. Can I ask you, sir? The no, session is I, formally I, I, uh, closed, yeah. I think. So you could always write to me if you want. You could always write to okay. me. I mean, this is a general, these are my concluding remarks would be that thank you so much yeah. for organizing this talk. And thank you uh, so much to the participants, especially the Tonmoy and the team that have uh, organized this talk and also the participants who have asked me oh, uh, and sort of been with me. So if you have any questions, feel free to write to me uh, as an okay. email. Uh, you could write uh, to Tonmoy as well, and um, Tonmoy will then forward these questions to me, or you could write to me um, in emails if you if you're interested, and I could share my email detail with Tonmoy later on um, as well. So um, thank you so much for all of you for being here and for participating. Thank you. So, so uh, now you can log out uh, from the session. Thank you. Yes, I. I'm still learning um, with Google. So, uh, the, so, uh, three buttons you can find there uh, audio, video, and uh, the middle, uh, the call in option. Right.